Hi there. How are you? It's the Full Cast and Crew Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Silo. I was going to be recording an episode this week about Sunset Boulevard, but my co-host needs a little extra time. So in the interim, I'm going to do an episode that I've been wanting to do for quite a while. I posted this on Instagram as a quiz, as a, or a poll, rather. I said, which of the two characters in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood should I do an episode about all of their scenes? If you follow the podcast or listened, or if you're new, you may not know that a while back I did a few episodes where I go really deep into a film that I really appreciate by covering all of a given actor's scenes within that film. I did this with Sean Penn as Jeff Spicoli in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which is a follow-up to the full episode about the film. I did it with Paul Newman in The Verdict, which is a full episode I did with Kier Graff. And I did another one. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, I've wanted to do something about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I've done a brief episode about it right when the film came out, but I haven't been able to really do justice to how much I love this film. And as I rewatched the film, thinking that maybe I would do an episode on it, it's almost just too much for a single episode. I think I'm going to reverse engineer this one and do an episode about all of Leonardo DiCaprio's scenes as Rick Dalton in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then I will give the people what they think they want because on the Instagram poll, I was shocked. I guess I shouldn't be shocked. Most people voted for uh, for Cliff. They voted for Brad, for Brad Pitt. Okay, that's okay too. But you know me, either you're getting really smart and you're learning to reverse psych me out, like overwhelmingly voting for Brad Pitt slash Cliff, knowing that then I will do Rick Dalton. Maybe you're that smart as a voting block. Or maybe I'm just a contrarian and going to do what I'm going to do. I will do Cliff because so many of you want Cliff's scenes, but I've got to start with Leonardo's scenes as Rick Dalton because that's the emotional and the spiritual centerpiece of the film even though the centerpiece of the film is this relationship between this actor and this stuntman and their friendship. And through that lens, we get to look at a very specific moment in Hollywood history in 1969. The times they are changing, people are getting left behind, new people are arriving. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> Many people missed that when the movie came out. Do you remember when this film came out and people were outraged? How dare he rewrite history? How dare he not show the brutality of the Manson family murders? Well, that's just to completely miss the point of what he is doing, which is to say, God, I love this era of Hollywood. And I wish that things could have gone differently for some very fascinating people who lost their lives due to some senseless violence. Wouldn't it be great since we're talking about an industry involved in the fantasy fairy tale creation business, if we could go back and reimagine the events of that horrible night going quite differently due to the heroics, the hilarious heroics of two extremely unlikely heroes who happen to represent what is rapidly becoming at the time a bygone era of Hollywood. And that's what Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth represent. So before I jump into Leo's scenes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, well, I'm not going to tell you, Quentin's going to tell you. Here's a little bit about how the origin of the film came to Quentin Tarantino's mind. I got the idea for the film in the very, very first place, way before I even knew it would end up being this. I thought that it would be nice someday to do a movie about uh, making movies. About 10 years ago, I was on a set and they had an older action actor was on it and he had a regular stunt guy, but we didn't really have anything for him. But then the actor came up to me and goes, you know, this one gag that we got doing it, you know, my guy could do that. And then I kind of watched them sitting in their director's chairs, talking to each other, like I'm sure they've been doing for 15 years. I mean, part of a relationship like that is being somebody's buddy on the set. And I got, that's an interesting relationship. And there we go. That's the jumping off point. 
So from there, you get all of the wonderful things that exist in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I'm going to start by talking about the start of the film, which is such a great moment. Um, It tells us so much, you know, one of the reasons this is one of my very favorite Tarantino films, if not my favorite Tarantino film, as you've heard me talk about many times on the podcast. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Jackie Brown. I think that still probably occupies position number one in my heart for Quentin Tarantino films. But this, man, the more I watch this, the more this is a film that's about everything I'm interested in. It's it's ripe with incredible references. And I just love the way we're introduced to Rick Dalton. There's three of them and one of me. Wilhelm scream right there, by the way. That's how you know a film has my true heart. The first minute you get a Wilhelm scream in this bounty law preview that we're being shown, introducing us to the heyday of Rick Dalton. Amateurs usually don't make it. Whether you're dead or alive, you're just a dollar sign to Jake Cahill on Bounty Law. Thursdays at 8.30, only on NBC. And that's the era that's kind of over. And then we have this kind of, this, this, I don't know, it's like a featurette of its time. Well, in a way, you are. To my right is Bounty Law. And this, I think, is Tarantino establishing the difference between Cliff Booth and Rick Dalton. Welcome, gentlemen, and thanks for taking the time to visit with us. Well, it's our pleasure, Alan. So (laughs) it's anything but his pleasure, clearly. And here's where Leo's kind of control of himself physically comes into play because he's like adjusting his belt, he's smoking, he's sort of he's doing this out of a sense of obligation. Leo gets uh, shot off his horse. Now, can I fall off a horse? Yes, I can. Yes, I have. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but say I laughter. fall off wrong and I, and I sprain my wrist or I, or I twist my ankle now that can put an undue burden on production because now maybe I can't work for a week so Cliff here is meant to help carry the load is that uh, how you describe your job Cliff? what carrying his load? yeah it's about right <laughs> <laughs> and then here you see that Cliff Booth is, is himself he's confident He's not playing along entirely. He's not losing his sense of himself. He knows from right here in the movie exactly who he is and what he's all about. Talking about Cliff Booth here, talking about uh, Brad Pitt's portrayal of it. He's comfortable with his own status, whereas in this scene, this scene is taking place in black and white, so bounty law is still a thing. This is Rick at his peak. We can see Rick starting to take it for granted, and that's where the film kind of picks up. Um, I want to also just note something that really was apparent to me when I watched this film this time, which is that the audio design of this picture is phenomenal. There are clues and cues in every single sound that you hear on this soundtrack. The ads, uh, the songs, of course. It's a lot of what you've come to expect. And... Then, as Rick and Cliff arrive uh, at the meeting with the brilliant character played by Al Pacino, uh, Mr. Swartz, not Schwartz, it's nicely contrasted with Sharon Tate flying in the Pan Am luxury lounge. Whereas here, Rick's entry from his worn Cadillac is presaged by a shower of cigarette butts and other detritus perhaps signaling to us that Rick either is or thinks of himself as trash tossed on the scrap heap by an uncaring and fickle industry that's changing underneath his feet. The times are changing. And the ways in which these things are changing are going to be explained to him in no uncertain, in no uncertain terms by Pacino's swores. And this is just a brilliant use of kind of a montage of shots here where Tarantino is establishing all of the Hollywood players that we are going to be encountering and and doing so largely wordlessly. It's just 
full command of 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 vibe and um <laughs> you see cliff murder revenge and passion and rick sucking down Brown their drinks Angeles at musso and frank's waiting for mr swores and one of the things that's great in this restaurant scene is um, you get to see all of Rick's post-Bounty Law film career. We don't know it yet at this point in the narrative, but you come to find out that he quit Bounty Law for a film career. Since I just finished watching a Rick Dalton fucking film festival, I think I know who you are. Put it there. <laughs> well, yeah. It's my pleasure, Mr. Schwartz, and, and and thank you for taking an interest. Sure. Now, that's the first time that you hear Rick Dalton's off-camera voice, because when he's acting, he doesn't have the stutter and the facial tics. But when he's off-camera and when he's stressed, he does. And Pacino's doing such a great thing opposite DiCaprio here. He's playing, you know, the slimy producer who's damning with faint praise, who is pretending to be buddy-buddy, but is like kind of negging on Rick Dalton in order to get him to do what he wants. Nice Schwartz. Ah, God, God damn it, the hell. I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. It's my pleasure, Mr. Schwartz. Call me Marvin. Marvin, call me Rick. <clears throat> Rick? Yeah. Oh, is that your son? <laughs> my son? <laughs> no, it's, that's my stunt double, Cliff Booth. Yeah. Good to meet you. We've worked together since the, uh, the last two seasons of Bounty Law. Yeah. My, my car's in the shop, so he, he gave me a ride. That's a big fucking lie. Rick got his driver's license taken away for too many drunk driving tickets. Cliff drives him everywhere. So that, now that's Kurt Russell's voiceover, which is kind of brilliantly deployed in a very few places. I want to say and you hear a nice book in there from Cliff. I try. He's a good friend. Sure. And as this scene unfolds, there's just so many great little things that DiCaprio reacts to. The touching of him by Swars. Um, you know, and again, you get to see all of the kind of steps descending the ladder that his career has taken since he left his hit TV show. Now, of course, it's 1969. The TV show itself would probably have gone away of its own volition. So one of the things that you can hear Rick Dalton beating himself up for is kind of jumping off this train. He says, you know, Screen Gems will never forgive me for that last season. But, you know, how much longer could it go for? And then there's this brilliant sequence where Schwarz and his wife are watching a couple films in the Rick Dalton oeuvre. Um, and this is just such a great sequence to indicate Rick's insecurity. But in a critical way here. What a picture. Good, good picture. Yeah. That is so much fun. All the shooting. <laughs> I love that stuff, you know, the killing. A lot of killing. A lot of killing. You know, in a way, this insecurity doesn't feel innate to Rick Dalton. It feels drilled into Rick by his awareness of his descent down that ladder of showbiz hierarchy. And I think that's crucial because I think part of what Tarantino is aware of and is is getting into in this film is um, what the industry does to those who prop it up and how it can prey upon your psyche. And there's a lot of things that happen as we talk further through these scenes where you'll, you'll hear little drops of wisdom and pearls of wisdom in, in very specific moments that are about what it does to people. And Tarantino, it, it, I, I'm thinking about this because, you know, I just did Clute and was talking about Alan Pakula and how he and someone like Sidney Lumet held themselves apart from sort of the current, at the time, auteur theory of filmmaking, which said, oh no, the director is the artist and through his art, that's how we understand these things as great works of art. But I think Tarantino has always had an appreciation for more middle-brow forms of television and films, and he celebrated them, and rightfully so. I think that's how he grew up, watching films in grindhouses and in theaters in black neighborhoods that would play 
black exploitation and other double features, sometimes strange bedfellows. For example, he tells a story in his book about seeing a double feature with a black exploitation film paired with Taxi Driver, which the audience just sort of treated like another exploitation film. You talking to me? You talking to me? You talking to me? Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? Talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Oh, yeah? Huh? Okay. This is a great little scene that's played Russell in the state of Wyoming, from Bounty Law with alive. DiCaprio and Michael Madsen. And you brought him here to collect. I don't even know where here is. It's just the closest place. Caught up with him about five miles outside of town. So, Bounty Killer. The name of this town is Janice Town. And that boy you killed was Jody Janice. He was the baby boy of Major Nathan Maxwell Janus. Who's Major Nathan Maxwell Janus? Well, I'll be sure and introduce you when he gets here. Now, not only is this such a great deployment of Michael Madsen, who's such a great actor that he imbues that one scene with so much. But Rick is good at this kind of work. He's He's got an easy command and an alpha presence. He's at home in this type of a series. And I think these clips that are shown are Tarantino's homage to these types of shows and to appreciating those kinds of shows. I think you have to appreciate his decisive non-pretentiousness as we then follow Rick Dalton down the ladder to Hullabaloo. I guess this is a song. I don't know if this is a real song or this is written for the film. But it's a hokey novelty variety show song about the pornographic film Behind the Green Door. And here's where he's really put into his place. Pilot for CBS right now. It's called it's called Lancer. Play the heavy. Did a <clears throat> Ron Ely Tarzan. I did a Land of the Giants, Green Hornet. I, I did that show, uh, uh, Bingo Martin, with that kid Scott Brown. Yeah, and, and, and I got an FBI that, that, that airs this Sunday. You, um, you, you always play the bad guy on these shows. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So and they, they have a fight scene at the end. Of them? Well, uh, not not, uh, not 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 Land of the Giants or, or FBI, but the, the rest, yeah. And you lose in the fight? <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm, I'm, I'm the heavy. <laughs> oh, that's an old trick pulled by the networks. Now, you take Bingo Martin, for example. Uh-huh. Okay. So you got a new guy like... Now, here, as Schwarz, who's such a dick, he's breaking Rick down to get what works for Schwartz. And Rick, at this point, is kind of unaware of what's about to be dropped on him. He's unaware that he's at the stage he's at in his career in a certain manner. And the way that this is played out on DiCaprio's face as the following dialogue unfolds is so perfectly played by DiCaprio. It's so it's so well shot by Tarantino. There's this slow push in as the moment of realization sinks in. And this is the humiliation. This is the straight up abject to your face humiliation you don't often get in Hollywood. Often it's all happening and you're the last to know. Here he's a bit the last to know, but he also kind of does know. It's a confirmation. That's what's heartbreaking about this scene. You want to build up his bona fides? So you hire a guy from a canceled show to play the heavy. (laughs) Then at the end of the show when they fight, It's hero besting heavy. But what the audience sees is Bingo Martin whipping Jake Cahill's ass. You see? Then next week, it's Ron Eli 
Next week, it's Bob Conrad wearing his tight pants, kicking your ass. Yeah. <laughs> now, in another couple of years, playing punching bag to every swinging dick new to the network, that's going to have a psychological effect on how the audience perceives you. Right. So, Rick, who's going to kick the shit out of you next week? You Mannix? Know, this is such an man from evil the monologue from delivered How about to that? Rick Dalton's face. And DiCaprio is, he's wounded. And Pacino is getting off on this. His, his producer character enjoys doing this. And DiCaprio's face is so pained and so scrunched up. I mean, he literally drives him to tears at the end, at the exit of this scene. He's, he's, he's fleeing the restaurant in tears. Uh, it's just such a brutal, brilliant scene. And it also kind of further establishes Cliff as the disparity between Cliff and Rick and their, their right, worldviews and approaches. It's official, old buddy. It has been. What are you talking about? What did that guy tell you? Told me the goddamn truth is what he told me. Whoa, whoa. Oh, hey. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Here, put these on. Don't cry in front of the Mexicans. Now, what's got you so upset, man? <laughs> well, coming face to face with the failures that is your career ain't worth crying about, then I don't know what the fuck is. Well, there you have it. That's, that's the establishing... Rick Dalton conflict. And he puts it so perfectly um, in, in this, this brief, uh, this brief little synopsis here as they drive away. Again, more of this incredible radio background. More than 1,000 communist dead are reported in new, large-scale fighting in South Vietnam. The U.S. losses are said to be at least 100 dead. And then you have this great crane shot showing you Hollywood of its era. Vintage cars, the signage. And then we kind of hear the introduction, then we see the introduction to the hippies. And what's great about Leo's synopsis here is here's the here's a career five years of ascent <laughs> ten years of of of, of, of treading water now race to the bottom <laughs> there you have it five years of ascent ten years of treading water and now a race to the bottom that's a career in Hollywood as Rick Dalton sees it what's also great about this shot is I've seen in the the making of, you know, when you have an interior driving scene, the car is typically being towed on a camera platform. It's so funny. You're watching Brad's arm and he's just moving the wheel slowly. If you think about when you drive, you don't really move the wheel that much, do you? Like you move the wheel if you need to turn. But in a movie, you have to indicate that you're driving. It's just a funny little actor thing I enjoy watching. And what's also great in this sequence is this kind of introduces us to the plot element that uh, that Rick lives next to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. Before that, I want you to listen closely here because as they pull up to the street where Dalton and Polanski live, which is Cielo Drive, listen to the sound design under the sign. <laughs> There's, a, there's like a wolf howl that's pretty cool. Right here. Down there, I need your hide off Frank Sinatra, Bill Cosby, and Nancy Sinatra with Tom Smothers as master of ceremonies will appear in concert for the neighbors of Watch Benefit, April 28, 1850. Did you hear that just at the end? The little, it's like a woo. That's right as the sign for Cielo Drive uh, comes into view. And another great touch here. And another truism is after this shit monger of a day that Rick Dalton has had, he's, he's excited to see Polanski pull into his own driveway. And it gives you a bit of Rick Dalton's humanity, I think. I think it makes us appreciate him that he's still wowed 
And he still wants to believe his cup can be filled by just citing Polanski pulling in uh, to the driveway. Because Polanski and Sharon Tate represent the next wave that Rick is not a part of. Four men on a search. Each man <laughs> living his own way, searching, discovering numero uno, the new thing in colognes for men. In all the world, there are only four basic masculine scents. Holy shit. <laughs> no, that, that was Polanski. That was Roman Polanski. He's, he's, he's lived there for a month now. First time I've seen him. <laughs> Holy shit. That's the first time we've seen Rick Dalton smile and, and chuckle genuinely. God damn it. And he's happy. What I always say, most important thing in this town is when you're making money, you buy a house in town. You don't rent. Eddie O'Brien taught me that. Hollywood real estate means you live here. You're not just visiting, not just passing through. You fucking live here. <laughs> here I am, flat on my ass. And who, who, who do I got living next door to me? The director of Rosemary's fucking baby, that's who. Plants is the hottest director in town right now, probably the world. It's my next door fucking neighbor. (laughs) (laughs) Shit. I mean, who knows what could happen? I I could could be one pool party away from from starting a new Polanski movie. So you're feeling better now? Oh, yeah, yes. Sorry about all that. Give me my glasses back. Come get them, fucker. All right, all right, Audie Murphy, relax. There you go. You gonna need me for anything else? Nah, nah, nah. I got a lot of lines to learn for tomorrow. Shit. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my car to sun home. All right. All right, 7.15 a.m. 7.15. Out the door. Out the door. In the car. All right, it's see It's great. The, the relationship between these two is so great. It's, it's cute. It's, it's awkward. It's tentative. It's, it's, um, it's, it's what you want. You want to see these two guys struggle to understand their feelings for each other. And we get that in this movie and it's never overplayed. It's never underplayed. I believe it's perfectly tonally played how they are together. There's some great sequences, which you'll have to wait for when I do Brad Pitt's Cliff Booth scenes. But when we come back to Rick at home, he is getting ready to do the work. And what does that involve? That involves old school acting against himself on a tape recorder and making himself a nice pitcher of whiskey sours. Rick Dalton rehearsal tape starting in five, four, three, two, one. Pepe, get your beat on behind that bar. I got a guest. Johnny says, uh, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. How's the beans? I've had worse. Johnny says, uh, Spanish, a toast. To my wife and all my sweethearts. Maybe they never made. What's so great is that Tarantino's Stay camera drink, pans Eddie, around behind table, Dalton and shows these talismans of his time at the top, his time as a TV star. He's parodied in Mad Magazine. He's on the cover of TV Guide. He's got a collection of beer steins. He's got a collection of Hopalong Cassidy mugs. He's floating in his pool. Wake her the heck up, get her down here. He's doing the work. This is great, great shot. Yes. Shot from above Rick's house where we can see cars I ain't gonna hurt uh, her. arriving. I just want her to play the fiddle. I go fetch her and tell her I give her a fat $5 gold piece. You play her little chili pepper heart out. So, Johnny, what else you heard about me? I heard you're pushing Lancer pretty hard, but Lancer has money. At some point... There's some of that excellent sound design again as we kind of move down the house and then we kind of rejoin uh, Sharon and Roman as they go out. Roman is perhaps pointedly dressed, basically like Austin Powers. I'm not sure if that's a inside joke by Tarantino or just an accurate representation of an actual Roman Polanski outfit, which it probably is. So I love this scene with Rick because another thing is that we don't yet know that while he's doing the work, he's learning his lines. And sure, he's in the pool with a pitcher of whiskey sours, but he's learning his lines. But he's also fucking up by getting drunk. And as we scan the remnants of his time at the top, we see those those remnants of 
when he was a star. We're also seeing this amazing movie poster collection. I just read a little blurb that said that Leonardo DiCaprio has what might be the greatest film poster collection in Hollywood. I don't know if some of these ones that we're seeing are from his collection or probably more likely from Tarantino's personal collection. And as I said, once we rejoin Rick, we, we can see now the horrific hungover condition that this poor guy puts himself in on an important day of filming for this pilot that represents both opportunity and a come down because he's not the star of the pilot, he's the bad guy. And however they physically created this sense of hangover in DiCaprio, I don't know what they put in his eyes or... Is so good. Hey, I think the wind blew down my TV antenna last night. So, well, I pissed fart around the wardrobe. You mind going home and fixing it? I can. And this is the little great, you know, pep talk that Cliff is there to give. Uh, to give Rick when he needs it most. All right. Well, if you don't need me for anything, and I think, else, I'll pick you, up and I wonder if. I don't need you. Not today. Well, I don't no, have to wonder because it's explicitly kind of laid out. See it right. But this is part of why Rick goes on to triumph in this scene. Hey, you're Rick fucking Dalton. Don't you forget it. And that's what Cliff represents. You know, Cliff is the conscience of the film that understands you're Rick fucking Dalton. You've done things in this town. You know, don't lose your sense of yourself because everyone else around you is going to lose their sense of you. So it's up to you to find it within yourself and not be consumed by their craven scrabbling towards what's next. There's a nice callback to... Paul Newman here, where Rick is soaking his face in a bowl of ice cubes and water. And this vulnerability that Leo shows in this scene with his director is great. I'm the one who cast you, and I could not be more delighted that you're doing this. Oh, well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. That's a good part. Yeah, it is. Have you met Jim Stacy the series lead? Uh, not yet. No, no. Well, you guys are going to be dynamite together. Mm, mm. Well, it's... Sounds like exciting. Yeah, lightning in a bottle. <laughs> now, you meant... It's just Sonya. so good. Makeup and, hair. and this whole sequence is incredible. I mean, this is like a third of the movie is Rick Dalton on set of the Lancer pilot and what happens to him intercut with Cliff's experiences out at the ranch and with Sharon's experiences. But this movie within a movie is so good and 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 is such the heart of the film and it's so what the film is about because it's got this pathos that DiCaprio is just so so capable of doing all of these things you know so perfectly he he can do the wounded part he can do the funny part he can do uh the dramatically intense parts. And I think the bit of acting that he ends up doing on the Lancer set is all the more impressive because it's TV cowboy show acting, but it's good. It's undeniably great. And I think he even surprises himself when the film gets there. Um, I'm going to be looking forward to doing the Cliff Booth scenes because the scene with Cliff Booth and, and Bruce Lee is just, is forever. It's so good. It's so brilliantly played. Um, and the sequence where Cliff encounters uh, his co-star in the Lancer pilot played by Julia Butters. He's a great actor. This is a great sequence where um, he's, he's wandering through 
the themes of a Western in a meta sense because he's wandering through a set, but on this set we can see the equipment and the apparatus used to create the illusion, if that makes sense. But as Tarantino says in one of the featurettes, he's about to have a gunfight with himself. And so Tarantino says this is his okay corral, except it's all against himself. It's a battle within himself. And so it's such a great meta moment when he stumbles through the set and you see the trappings of the Old West, but you also see the mechanisms and the and the the mechanical aspects of filmmaking. Now, this is a curious moment here I've always wondered about. Right here, he has a beverage in a styrofoam cup, and he just throws it on the ground mm. in front of Trudy, played by Julia Butters, his young co-star who's going to play Mirabella Lancer. He throws this cup. He doesn't bother to go put it in a garbage can. I, I guess it's about the next next generation because his co-star he's about to learn is eight years old and she is far more professional than he has ever been or is in this moment and obviously much less hungover. She's sitting reading a book and fully prepared, by the way. He throws the cup. Is that the behavior of a star who hasn't unlearned the entitlements of a star? Is it contrasting his lack of professionalism with what we're about to learn is her professionalism so far beyond him in approach? Is it another nail in the coffin of his career? He's drinking, he's smoking, he's sick. This is just a brilliant scene. And if you think about acting opposite a child, it's even more so because she's good. Don't get me wrong, but she's eight. And there's only a certain range that I believe you can get out of children who aren't savants at acting. And she is great in this scene. Um, and he is so great playing opposite her. <clears throat> he pockets his flask. Hello. 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 bother you if I sat next to you and read my book, too? I don't know. Would you bother me? I'll try not to. Sit. <laughs> and, and, you know, with that, she assumes the power in the scene here. You can have two Ugh. no more different people. This broken wreck. <clears throat> but is he doing this to annoy her a little bit? Or is he just oblivious? It's hard to tell. But he looks so blown out. And his cool attempt to snap his lighter is thwarted by what happens after he inhales. Ah. Sorry. Sorry about that. <clears throat> <laughs> this is the humor I'm talking about, but this pathos underneath the humor, he's playing lunch. all of this at the same time. So good. I've got a scene after lunch. Yeah? Eating lunch before I do a scene makes me sluggish. I believe it's the job of an actor, and I say actor, not actress, because the word actress is nonsensical. I agree with you there. It's the actor's Mirabella job Lancer. to avoid impediments to their performance. It's the actor's job to strive for 100% effectiveness. Naturally, we never succeed, but it's the pursuit that's meaningful. Who are you? He's just you so blown away. It's so great. And you know what's incredible for actors and why actors, I'm sure, love working with Tarantino is think about this scene. What's your real name? This is a nearly 12 minute scene. 12 minutes just between the two of them. 12 minutes of screen time. And it's all dialogue, it's simply photographed. There are a few cutaways. But it's all brilliant acting between these two actors. 
And what we're learning from from Rick is so heartbreaking and real. Pronounced Caleb Dakota. I'm pretty sure it's Dakatu. 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 And coming up here is just one of DiCaprio's great moments in the film <coughs> as they talk about what they're reading and he takes out his Western paperback. Now, one of the things that it occurred to me when I watched the film this time is I'd read, you know, Tarantino did a novelization of the film and it's so brilliant because it's caused me when I'm watching it, I'm like, wait, what about that scene? What about that scene? I realize these are scenes that are in the book that aren't in the movie. He goes into much greater detail on things like Cliff Booth's wife and the diving accident, in quotes, that caused him to maybe be responsible for his wife's death. It goes into greater detail about difficulties that Rick Dalton had on sets with directors. And um, But this is one of Leo's great moments in the film. And I wonder if the breeziness... If you'll pardon the easy breezy pun here. A guy who's a bronco buster. It's the story of his life. The guy's name is Tom Breezy, but everyone always calls him Easy Breezy. Now, when Easy Breezy when his, was in his 20s and, and, and young and good looking, he could, he could break any horse that you could throw at him. Back then, he just had a way. Now, he's into his... Uh, late 30s and he takes a bad fall and messes up his hip. He's not, he's not he's not crippled or anything like that, but but he's got spine problems he never had before and he spends uh, more of his days in pain than, than, than he ever did before. He's also Keepers, this sounds like a good clearly novel. talking about his, his own self here as an yeah, actor. It's not bad. But Where are you in it? I wonder if about midway. The, the, the strength of the acting in a scene like this that's coming up here, now. you know, gets uh, he's, um, obscured he's, by the more comedic or cartoonish aspects of the film. In fact, far from But it. the acting here is as good as anything you're ever going to see. He's coming to terms with what it's like to be slightly more used to. Slightly more useless each day. It, it's okay, Caleb. It's okay. She refers to him as his character. Sounds like a really sad book. Poor Easy Brazy. I'm practically crying, and I haven't even read it. About 15 years, you'll be living it. What? <laughs> That's one of the great lines in the screenplay. About 15 years, you'll be living it. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. You know something? You, uh, you might be right about this book. I think it hits harder than I gave it credit for. Now, in a way, you know, here is Rick getting in touch with something essential about himself through his co-star. She's bringing it to the forefront emotionally for him. And then in the scene that they're about to play out later in this scene, um, you know, that's where he's going to get the juice from to be brilliant in the scene that he is going to undeniably be brilliant in. And another part of Tarantino's thing that's so finely wrought. Rick Dalton. You bet. Jim Stacy. This is my show. Welcome aboard. Mm, We're yep. real glad to have a pro like you playing the heavy on the pilot. And I got to tell you. Timothy Oliphant is so great as the. Being the 14th of Glusky. As oh, Jim Stacy, who's, <laughs> who's in this flush of... I just got my part for sheer luck. He's in the flush of fame. He's the star of the pilot. In the park. The, 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 the and he's the also not letting Rick Virginia, forget that's who how Rick is now. Uh, hey, Rick, I got to ask you something I heard about. 
Was it true you almost got the McQueen part in The Great Escape? Now, I don't know if this is intentional on Tarantino's part, but this this sequence is cut so interestingly. Even in those first bits of dialogue between between Rick and Jim Stacy, there are these hard cuts in what otherwise plays like a uninterrupted stream of dialogue. Is this Tarantino contributing to Rick's death by a thousand cuts, or am I reading too much into the filmmaking? But this humiliation that he's describing here, I think in the book, there's more to this story where he's like fired from the McQueen film because we're seeing him cut into the actual film. Three Georges. Which three Georges? Papard, Maharis, and Shakaris. Oh, man. Yeah. That's got to hurt. Yeah, well, I didn't get it. McQueen did it. And frankly, I never had a chance. <laughs> What's great also is Jim Stacy is so clean shaven and perfectly tanned and shiny. And Rick is so grungy and scruffy and bedraggled. And between the humiliations of the young girl showing him professionalism he doesn't himself possess, this day for Rick on the pilot is just a constant reminder of the entirety of his career arc and exactly where he is on the parabola of fame. And one of the things I really love about Quentin Tarantino is he's aware of these stories of near misses in Hollywood. There's so many stories of actors who nearly got a role or were replaced in a role that would go on to make the actor that replaced them a star. And you could wonder, well, what if, you know, what if I had gotten that part. Would everything be different? I don't know. I don't know if it's that simple. I think stars are stars, and there's a thing about stars that's hard to categorize. But what what Tarantino is so great about here is finding the heart in, in these moments. He's not covering the gaudy showbiz moments on the way up or even the 10 years in the middle, he knows that the gold lies at the end of this arc and whether Rick Dalton and by association, everything Tarantino loves about what Rick Dalton represents will triumph or as is historically the case far too often, much like what's historically the case with the Manson killings, the guy we care most about isn't going to come through it. And then we have these movies within movies within movies, because once we're in the Lancer pilot scenes themselves, like we are here, they're filmed in color, uh, but they, we, but Tarantino doesn't break the wall of the scene when we're in it, such as here in this introduction. What are you doing of around here, boy? Jim oh, Stacy. That's a saloon, ain't it? Oh, yeah. That's a saloon. Only you can't come in. Mr. Gilbert. And here's Terrence. Here, Don't let me. Here's Rick Dalton being great right away. I know how bored and restless you get when you run out of tamales. <laughs> but Mr. Gilbert, if I was you, you'd find out that Jughead's name. Allow me to introduce the two of you. This here is Bob Gilbert. The businessman. That's right. Business Bob Gilbert. Who might he be, Caleb? Well, that's a fellow by the name of Madrid. <laughs> Johnny Madrid. Rick Dalton is great here. And you know, one of the cool things that occurs to me, and one of the difficult things it must be, unless I'm also overthinking how the acting works, but we're watching Leonardo, DiCar Leonardo DiCaprio play an actor who, at various times in the movie we're watching, displays acting of varying calibers and depths of ability. How he calibrates all of that is part of the film performance that Leonardo DiCaprio was giving, but it's also part of the life of Rick Dalton that we're experiencing. So there's so many layers to how 
the acting takes place here on screen. And as Jim Stacy enters into the bar room after dispatching with Business Bob, we, we then start to hear some of the lines that Rick was practicing in his pool. You know, here's where the dialogue comes back Let's in. Let's go. Tienen comida. Más frijoles y tortillas. How's the beans? How bad worse? Entonces, dame un plato de frijoles. One dollar. To my wife and all my sweethearts, may they never meet. Senor Madrid, you care to join me at my table where I entertain my guests? I'd be delighted, Monsieur de Cactu. So, you know, Take here, the bottle with you. Rick's in charge, even though he's oh, the guest honey. star. What brings you to Royo del Oro? I guess it would have been too much to sort of play this like Jim Stacy is aware he's being outacted by his. Uh, his his bit player, his hen- the the henchman in his pilot, or whether it being good is enough for everyone, I don't know. But this is one of the critical moments here in the whole film. Hey, where's that chili pepper daughter of yours with the fiddle? She's asleep. Wake her the heck up, get her down here with her fiddle and her bow, and entertain my guests. But please, don't hurt her this time, huh? I ain't gonna hurt her. I just want her to play the fiddle. Line, go, go, go fetch her and tell her what? Go fetch her and tell her I'll give her a fat five dollar gold right, piece. Right, right. Go fetch her and tell her I'll give her a fat, fat five, fat five dollar gold piece. She play her little chili pepper heart out. Right. Right. Got it. That's such a huge moment in the whole film because Tarantino brilliantly breaks the film within a film. You hear the the guitar music fade out and it, and it contributes this pregnant pause. It's such a great way to indicate as a filmmaker that that Rick Dalton has forgotten his line. And it breaks for the first time the continuity of these Lancer pilot scenes in such a great way. <clears throat> I ain't gonna hurt her. I just want her to play the fiddle. Now go fetch her and tell her I'll give her a fat $5 gold piece. She play her little chili pepper heart out. It's gone. <laughs> so, Johnny, what else you heard? Now what's great here I heard you pushing Lance is pretty hard. Tarantino shows us a Lance camera move, one. which now that we're back in the narrative, plays like He's just the way the film is unfolding in front of us. But when Rick goes up again and forgets his lines right here. Line, 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 line. Maybe he already has. <clears throat> Maybe. God damn it, I fucked this whole thing. Oh, keep damn going. I fucked this whole thing. Oh, God. Can we just go back, please? Can we just cut? Can we just cut? No, really, just no, really, Sam, really, Sam. Line. Please, God, maybe he already has. All right, all right. Maybe he already has. Right. God damn it! All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Woo! God damn outlaw, Rick. Come on now. Mm. Whew. Whew. I got it. I got it. Go back a bit, would you? No, he's right. Back to one. <laughs> so we go back to the beginning of this camera movement. Oh, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna so again, we now we realize we're seeing the filming of this pilot. And, and Timothy Oliphant is a little bit displeased, by the way. But here we go again. I heard you're pushing Lancer pretty hard. But Lancer has got money. At some point, he's going to hire some guns. And push back. Maybe he already has. Maybe. Maybe I don't like Lancer. Maybe I don't like his boots. Maybe 
I don't like the way he uses those boots to step on people. Now, here, again, is one of the more extraordinary sequences of the film, which is, for us, it feels like, you know, we've seen Rick have a little victory. I mean, this is the type of thing that happens all the time. Actors maybe flub a line or... But the reaction that then plays out is all the more brilliant for not originally being in this in the script whatsoever and not even being a part of the plans of the film uh, as described by Tarantino himself in one of the features where he and the cast members are talking about how this moment came to be in the film. Leo had a whole thing at some point. It was like, look, I need to, I need to ruin it during the Lancer sequence, all right? And when I blow the scene, I need to have a real crisis of conscience about it, and uh, I have to come back from that. Can we just go back, please? Can we just cut? Can we just cut? No, really, just no, keep Sam, going. No, Sam, 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 please. Maybe he already has. All right, all right. Maybe he already all right. has. All right, all right, all right. All right. I'm outlaw, Rick. Come on now. <clears throat> I got it. I got it. Go back a bit, would you? So we did the Lancer scene without it, and then we did it with it. And that was so amazing, all right, that of course we're going to use it. Um, but then it was like, well, now we need a little bit more than that. If we're going to really build up, the, you know, you're, you're having a, a you know, your gunfight at the OK Corral, but it's with yourself. <laughs> As you walk back uh, to the Lancer set, I was like, I think I described it exactly this way, and I think we shot it exactly this way. It was like, well, it's got to be like Travis Bickle when he's in his apartment by himself. Burst yourself like that. Bro. So incredible. You're sitting there like a baboon. You know, that's the power of having an actor of the caliber of DiCaprio is, is again, you can have these incredible moments that are played so real. You know, they're not uh, artificial. What the fuck was that? Jesus Christ! Fuck! Shit. Damn it, Rick. I swear to God. Fucking lines, embarrass yourself like that in front of all those goddamn people. Well, you were drinking all night. Fucking drinking again, eight goddamn fucking whiskey sours. <sighs> fucking bullshit. <laughs> you're a fucking miserable drunk. You fucking remembering your fucking lines. I practiced them and now I don't look like I goddamn practiced them. You're sitting there like a fucking baboon. <laughs> I hate fucking whiskey sour. I couldn't stop at fucking three or four. Right? Why? You're a fucking alcoholic. You fucking drink too much, huh? Every fucking night, every fucking night. That's it. That's fucking it. That's fucking it. You stop drinking right now, all right? Make a promise to yourself you're going to stop fucking drinking. Then he goes and grabs a drink. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> ah! Look at that little fucking girl. This is an amazing You're going to show that goddamn Jim Stacy. You're going to show all of them on that goddamn fucking set who the fuck Rick Dalton is, all right? Let me tell you something. You don't get these lines right. I'm gonna blow your fucking brains out tonight. All right? Your brains are gonna be splattered all over your goddamn pool. I mean it, motherfucker. Get your shit together. That's incredible. That is so incredible. And you heard him say it right there. I'm gonna show that little girl. I'm gonna show Jim Stacy. These are the people who are letting him know where he's not at and where he's at. And he's going to show them. And he is. And that's the most unvarnished look inside Rick Dalton's soul that we're ever going to get. And it's just so powerful and, and, and really well done. And it's serious. It's not comic like so many other beats in the film. You know, what were we talking about when we talked about The Third Man where where the director had said, you know, I think we're going to have to do a comic, uh, a comic noir. We're not going to, we're not going to be all one or the other. We're going to do, we're going to do a mix so that we don't have to be, we don't have to hit the jokes every, you know, 14.3 seconds. And then we don't also have to have the action and the chase sequences of 
a different type of a film. You know, and, it's, and this is the hard to categorize thing about Tarantino films, I guess, you know, is I think the acting in these films gets way overlooked, way, way overlooked. I think the quality of the acting to do all of the things that actors are asked to do in Tarantino films doesn't get the same appreciation that dramatic, quote unquote, dramatic acting gets. Because if you're going to tell me that actors like DiCaprio and Brad Pitt in this film aren't displaying multiple layers of acting brilliance that in a straight comedy or a straight drama they wouldn't have to display, then you're just missing the whole point of the film. And so I think it just gets unfortunately kind of overlooked as, oh, it's a Tarantino performance. I'm assuming that at least these guys were nominated. Let's see what this was nominated for. Yeah, okay. Nominated for a lot of Academy Awards. Production design, supporting actor, actor, picture, original screenplay, director, cinematography, costume design, sound mixing, and sound editing. And Brad Pitt won, but Leo did not, which is so fascinating because it, it kind of, I think, makes my point. I'm sure, let's see, who, who won that Best Actor Oscar in that year? Let's see. Best Actor 2020. Here are your nominees. Leonardo DiCaprio for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Antonio Banderas for Pain and Glory. Adam Driver for Marriage Story. Exactly the type of performance that gets nominated. Jonathan Price for The Two Popes. And your winner, Joaquin Phoenix in Joker, which I can make an argument that sort of goes against my argument because is there dark comedy in Joker? Yes, but it's also, I think, first and foremost, a pretty brutal, straightforward drama. But for my money, this is a performance that is going to last. I think Joaquin Phoenix's performance in Joker will last too. But to me, it's not as indelibly important in a way as DiCaprio's. I just think that DiCaprio's performance has a lot to say in a way that is easy to overlook because, oh, it's just about Hollywood. It's a movie about Hollywood, so it can't be, can't be taken that seriously. Well, <clears throat> Look how seriously Tarantino takes. I rode with the British cavalry. Rick Dalton turning off his tape recorder. And as Tarantino so ably said, he's entering into this gunfight with himself. He's walking down towards the OK Corral, which is this, the, the, the bar room where the scene is going to to take place. And what's genius about DiCaprio in this performance is he's not playing this, this stuff at arm's length. Either the stuff off camera with Rick Dalton, such as right now, walking to his gunfight with himself in his OK Corral. He's not arm's length from that. He's not winking at that. He's all in. And again, we have this apparatus and the machinery and the fakery assembled on the set and then, you know, we get into this sequence, which is Rick Dalton's finest moment. And again, I think the degree of acting that goes on here with Leo is so incredibly good. Nada. What the sun is. Ah. <laughs> One from Boston. I don't know. You from Boston? Yes. It's the Boston one. Keep the others outside. The brother come in. You heard him, Boston? Mm. 
by the way, total props to Luke Perry. I think this is his final film role before he passed away. He's great. I told you they'd come to parlay. You all right, honey? Oh, she's just fine. Ain't you shorty? I'm fine, Scott. They haven't hurt you? Not yet, I ain't. But that can all change like that. <laughs> Say, where'd you get that lamp? From the war. I rode with the British cavalry in India. Listen to this unhinged laugh. What did they call that outfit? Bengal Lancers. <laughs> No, 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 that is funny. That is funny. That's not so funny. Don't you get it? Bangle Lancer? Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of funny. It is. <laughs> you do know kidnapping is a hanging <laughs> So's blowing the heads off little girls. <laughs> like, this is they both... They can only hang me once. Such a commentary right. on this kind of TV yeah. acting... And also a superlative example of this kind of TV acting. And then also an example of acting that's so much better than the superlative example of this kind of TV acting. That's why this is kind of like thinking about the universe. Your mind starts to get very interestingly complicated. So what's next? Well, I'll send one of my boys out to your ranch to fill you in on all the details, but, uh... Now, one detail I'm gonna fill you in on right now is this. I don't want no Beaner Bronco Buster handing me that $50,000. I want the old man himself. Murdoch Lancer puts $50,000 in my lap, or I'll eat this little picture down a well! You got that, Boston? Huh? Yeah. All right, messenger boy. Deliver my message. Give me evil, sexy Hamlet. There's the director off screen. Enjoy it. (laughs) And cut. What's great, there's a little throwaway oh, shot of Jim Stacy watching I'm this, Timothy Oliphant's character. He's got his arms kind of crossed. I got pads he seems a little unhappy. And I always throw myself on the floor, just for fun, even when I'm not getting paid. <laughs> now what's great here is how emotional Rick Dalton gets in the aftermath of this and how uncomfortable he is accepting these compliments. little girl on the ground, that just worked like a charm. I figured you said Shakespeare. Yeah, well, that's right. That was, and that's what I mean by scare me. Yeah. Evil Hamlet scares people. All right. Oh, and by the way. Nicholas Hammond is brilliant. Beaner Bronco Buster? Where the hell did that come from? Improv. It was wonderful. That was a triple alliterative improv. Don't hear those too often. Okay. All right. We're all good. Don't need to go again. No, we're done. That was fantastic. All right. Okay, moving on. We're in the bordello. Now, what's incredible here, as the girl comes back up to him, is how well-timed... That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. How well-timed DiCaprio's tearing up is right here. (laughs) She makes him cry with this compliment. And it's in his eyes, and it's one take. Rick is having a hell of a day. I think he's cried three times today. And there's the cap, right? <clears throat> because who's who, who's the guy that told him he's Rick fucking Dalton? You know, it's Cliff. And it's part of their inseparable bond. It's part of what makes them such a great team. I think that's acting by God. That is acting. It's just so good. And what's also so great is Tarantino is so in command of Los Angeles that 
he uses this incredible version of California Dreamin' over just the right golden hour evening tones as night falls on Los Angeles and everyone is leaving and going back to their home life, which of course involves driving on the streets of Los Angeles. This is somehow such a fitting emotional cap to what we just saw Rick Dalton go through. You know, Tarantino knows that essence. If you've ever driven in Los Angeles during the golden hour and the windows are down, Rick has a contented look on his face for the first time. The windows are open. And one of the charms of when they pull in here to Rick's house is the shy sort of way that Rick um, asks Cliff if he wants to come in. (laughs) I just love this. I love this interaction. You, uh, you gonna come in and watch my FBI? Well, I just figured we would. I got a six pack in the back. Thought we'd order a pizza. All right. This is the way he goes. All right. He's so happy. This is one of my favorite favorite scenes. It's kind of like the DVD commentary within the movie as they watch the FBI show on Rick's TV. miles to Pendleton, will it? Any kind of luck will be unloaded and back at El Toro before my kids go to bed. Hey, bought me an acid dip cigarette today. Oh, yeah? It's just a little bit of my cigarette to set up for what's going to happen yeah. later, but... If I'm going to trip, I'm going to trip here. I love how they're watching this together, how they're having a commentary about what they're watching. Just going to stash it here. And it also continues to establish Rick firmly on the wrong side, quote unquote, of drug use and the 1969 moment. Here I come. There's the most memeable moment from the movie the DiCaprio pointing from the recliner at the TV. What's the trouble, Corporal? There's a truck tailing us, sir. Wars is watching as well. And this is a nice moment because this is like Rick Dalton is about to have a bit of a career. I don't want to say resurgence, but it's this strong turn that causes Swords to make the final call and get Rick into the Italian westerns. I think Tarantino had as much fun. Uh oh. Here comes trouble. Doing this. FBI stuff. Boom! <laughs> oh man, right in the face. That was a smooth leap. Thank you. I love that. That was a smooth leap. Thank you. Mm. Dead number two. They appreciate these things in these performances. It looks so easy. <laughs> I like that shot. That guy's a fucking prick. <laughs> Commenting on his co-stars. Well, that's Bobby Hogan, good guy. I right, get ready for my big FBI moment. They're all dead, babe. Good. Michael Murtaugh. The Michael Murtaugh. <laughs> so that's how Rick gets over to um, to Italy. And now Rick is the one who's on Pan Am. He's heading to this uncertain future of what it's like to star in Italian westerns. And we have this incredibly kind of, I don't want to say truncated bit, but we kind of go through Rick going to Italy. He appears in, I think, four movies. He gets a wife and he comes back. And then they have this kind of great, almost breakup scene that he and Cliff have now that he is returned to his 
uncertain future. No, it's not because not you just got it done. You know, they go out, <clears throat> they get plastered. Um, uh, but I missed this scene. I wanted to play this because it's so good. When in Spain, sorry, in Italy, they, uh, it's just another, I, I just think it's another great bit of, um, of Leo acting is, is this kind of, you know, breakup, this breakup conversation with Cliff, because it's, it's just such a, a funny kind of nuanced scene. I mean, they're dressed, <clears throat> they're on set, so they're dressed as each other. And Brad sort of has this pompadour meant to approximate Rick Dalton's. But I wonder if it's also a little bit of a callback to, what's that movie, Suede Head? Was, this, was it a movie? It comes to However, as the two men return home, they've come to an understanding. Well, here it goes now. With the, uh, with the new wife, I, uh, I just, I, I can't afford you anymore, Cliff. You know, I can barely afford my own house anymore. So I think the plan is to sell the house and buy, buy a condo in, in Toluca Lake, bank the money, you know, live off it, that type of thing. Hopefully I score come next pilot season. It's a good plan. Yeah. yeah. But then I don't know if I, if I have a career or not. If, if I'm a solid Los Angeles citizen like Eddie O'Brien says, or if I'm one step closer to going back to Missouri. So when this whole European journey is over, I think we've uh, we reached the end of the trail, Cliff. What's fascinating about this scene, not only the punctuation of Brad sipping so longly from his beverage, I'm not sure if it's played where Rick is lying because we have that earlier scene where he's like, if you own real estate in Hollywood, it says you fucking live here. You're not visiting. So the concept that he would sell that and they would move to Toluca Lake and into an apartment and live off the proceeds, I don't know if I buy that. It doesn't look like Cliff really buys that either. We've seen Cliff be kind of a bullshit detector throughout the whole movie, starting with the very first scene at Musso and Frank when he sees Schwartz coming long before Rick does. So the way that Cliff reacts, I don't know. I guess one interpretation is Cliff is literally blowing smoke, not in the sort of traditional manner where he's praising Rick is blowing smoke, not that he's praising Cliff, but he's literally blowing his cigarette smoke in his face while he's jitteringly trying to communicate that he can't afford him. Uh, is that true? I mean, he's just made four movies in Italy. They do intimate that he spent a lot of the money on a swanky apartment while he was living in Italy. He does have the wife. Is it more about, hey, I'm married now. I can't have another guy kind of like in my life to this degree. We don't know, but- Cliff isn't making it easy for Rick in this scene. He's sort of just taking the news in. And it could be that, you know, for guys like Cliff, that's how quick his end comes in the business. Like, you know, does he catch on? He, we, we've learned that he's sort of a difficult hire as a stuntman for anyone other than Rick Dalton. He's clinging to to the bottom of the rung. And so for him, his prospects, he lives in a trailer out behind a drive-in movie theater. He clearly doesn't have savings. He doesn't have a pension plan. So it could just be that the shock on his face in this scene is about what's going to happen to me now. I'm not sure. But I think it's so interesting how uh, they play this scene. It's a little unresolved in a way. Um, I think in a good way. And it's kind of, and then it's followed by, you know, an interesting kind of callback to, to Sharon Tate's arrival at LAX, uh, which is, you know, she's got photographers and, um, and it's a big deal. It's glamorous. Uh, we have Rick and his new Italian wife coming through and, um, there is no reception. There's no one there to, to greet them. And 
what I love is as we get into this final 30 minutes of the film and the Manson uh, aspect, what's hilarious to me is as the Manson killers arrive in the cul-de-sac, Rick, who is inside after making a giant pitcher of margaritas at midnight, <laughs> is... <laughs> is so unconcerned about going out and screaming at them in such a hilarious fashion. And this, again, is part of the great comedic acting that DiCaprio does. But I think Tarantino's saying something with this scene. I just want to play this a little bit for you. Him making the margarita. He hears the muffler of the car outside of the cul-de-sac. Fucking private robe and property taxes of the butt. God. He's wearing a robe that only goes to mid thigh, by the way. Bunch of goddamn fucking hippies. <laughs> what the fuck? Hey, you! Yeah, asshole! I'm talking to you! What the hell do you think you're doing bringing that noisy hunk of shit around here at midnight? This is a private road, all right? Who are you? And who are you here to see, huh? Nobody, sir. We just got lost and a little turned around. Another cool oh, aspect of this film, which is, what, 2019? You have both Austin Butler you here. You came up here to smoke dope on a dark road, huh? Next time you want to try that, fix your fucking muffler. Look, we're really sorry we disturbed you. Look, Chief... You don't belong here. Austin Butler now, obviously is a massive star asshole. right now. And also Sydney Sweeney is oh, one of the uh, is one of the Manson girls. She's also a big star. But I love how Rick Dalton is so unconcerned about giving these hippies shit. Hey! Dennis Hopper! Move this fucking piece of shit! Alright, well just give and me a moment scares to turn them. it around. He has a gun. They have a gun, and they, he's, he's scaring the shit out of them. Okay, okay, stop yelling. Hold your horses. We're leaving. And taking drinks out of his pitcher of frozen margaritas, by the way. What the hell are you looking at, you little ginger-haired fucker? So hey, I think... Come around here again. I'm going to call the fucking cops. Is it... Is, is Tarantino saying that maybe with more Rick Daltons around at the time, then maybe these drugged out hippie waifs would have had less murderous success as they as they did in real life? You know, is everyone so caught up in the hippy dippy moment in 1969 that these real shit kicking Western type stars, you know, would have maybe cleaned up the town a little bit more? I don't know. It's not Rick who gets the glory moment, which is also kind of interesting. So I have an aversion on podcasts to playing loud screaming clips. And there's a section of the film where. This all sort of happens. The the retcon, as they say, of the Manson killings um, is just involves so much screaming that I'm not going to play it here. But what's great about the next scene with Rick is when he's being interviewed by the police. Uh, so around what time was it when you confronted the intruder? <laughs> about, uh, about midnight. Around midnight. Yeah. How, how do you know it was midnight? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was in the kitchen. Uh, I was making margaritas, and uh, I heard the sound of noise and muffler. I uh, looked up at the clock. It said, uh, the kitchen clock said midnight. 12 o'clock exactly? I mean, it could, could have been 12.05, something like that. And you didn't see him again until the woman attacked you in the pool? No, no. So what did these perpetrators... <laughs> He's just drinking a giant, now non-frozen margarita. And... One of my final favorite things here is both the great kind of moment that uh, Cliff here we go. and Rick have here in parting. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, 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 what hospital are you going to, Cliff? I'll meet you there, huh? Oh, uh, you don't want to meet me in no hospital. Why don't you go take care of your lady? Hey, she just took five fucking sleeping pills. She'll be asleep till Columbus Day. You guys will probably have to come out here again just to wake her ass up. 
Hey, I'm not going to die. I may get a limp, but I ain't going to die. It's not my time yet, man. All right. Snuggie's waiting in some waiting room. Why don't you go lie naked with that fine creature? Come visit me tomorrow. Bring bagels. If you want to do something for me, check on Brandy. She may be a little shook up after that. She may want to sleep with you. Are you kidding me? She's, she's sleeping with Francesca right now. You might never get her back. <laughs> we got to go. All right, then, Cliff. Well, see you tomorrow, then. Hey. Hey. Your good friend, Cliff. I tried. I love dudes trying to have feelings is so good. And the way he's, he has more to say, but it's abbreviated by the close of the ambulance door. And then he kind of knocks on the glass and he, he tells Cliff, you're a good friend. I love that. And I think it's such a great and touching send off to this friendship that these two will obviously continue to have. It's implied, I think, in this scene. And then another one of my favorite DiCaprio scenes is this sequence where he's interacting um, with Emil Hirsch as um, as Jay Sebring, who you know tragically is one of the people who was actually killed in the Manson murders, along with Sharon Tate and their friends. But this interaction is such a an also a touching. Um, interaction. And I love how Leo plays the bashfulness of Rick Dalton when confronted with the glamorous next generation. The Polanskis. You're Rick Dalton, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Rick Dalton. <laughs> Live next door. Oh, I know. I tease Sharon that she lives next door to Jake Cahill. If she ever wants to put a bounty on Roman said, she just has to go next door, right? <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> what the f fuck happened? Now, what's fascinating oh, about the way this is staged is that middle. Jay is behind the closed gate of the Polanski Tate like driveway. This whole conversation is taking they place with a locked road. gate between them. Freaking Obviously, heavy-handed metaphor, we get it, but, you know, Jesus Christ, Jay and Sharon are inside Shangri-La, and Rick Dalton is out in the cul-de-sac. And behind Jay, there is beautiful... Yeah. Bougainvillea and lighting and, you, do you know, the trees are lit up, whereas behind Play Rick, it's just bullshit. a street, From an empty street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the one. Yeah, it still works, too. Thank God. <laughs> is everybody okay? And, you know, Rick's so excited to hear that Jay actually knows of him and knows of his career. And... You know, the button on this is is so nice. It's it's so clear. It's something that's true about Sharon Tate. Jay, honey, is everything all right? Everything's okay now, honey. Uh, but some hippies broke into the house next door. Oh, my God. Well, that's terrifying. Is everybody okay? I'm talking to your next-door neighbor about it right now. Rick Dalton? Yeah, that's me. You know, everyone says Sharon Tate is a really wonderful person. And I think the way Margot Robbie plays her and the way Tarantino wrote yes, this character yes, bears that out. Everybody's fine. Are you okay? Well, yes, I am. Thank you for asking that. I love that line. Would you line. like to come up to the house for a drink and meet my other friends? Here you go. Here's the moment he presaged. And Jay Sebring gives him a thumbs up. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And the gates open. And guess what, Rick Dalton? <laughs> you have now been welcomed into a possible new future. Hey, Nut. Nice to meet you, huh? <laughs> JC Rick. Hey, pleasure. Yeah. Now, I've read interpretations of this that refuse to sort of take it at face value in hand in hand with once upon a time in Hollywood, the fairy tale nature of it, and say that, you know, this represents uh, Rick's death because the gates are opening and he's ascending to what for him is heaven, which is acceptance by this next generation of hot up-and-coming stars that 
you know, have excluded him. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. And she greets him so warmly. And this is a great little... She, she calls him a wonderful actor. Wonderful actor. And I love this because this is Tarantino saying, this is what should have happened instead of the horrible events of that night. This is Quentin giving all the Rick Daltons a chance they never had. And it's a fairy tale. And the film, as we get into the credits here, just to shout out some of the creative people involved, is so brilliantly shot by Robert Richardson, the director of photography. The production design is out of this world as most Tarantino films are. That's by Barbara Ling. And it's tricky because to production design this, you have to blend some fantastical elements of Quentin Tarantino's cinematic universe. The red apple cigarettes, the wolf's tooth dog food, with all the like meticulously researched and meticulously real elements as remembered by Tarantino and no doubt researched by Barbara Ling and her team. It's edited by Fred Raskin, I think assembling Tarantino films is is so incredible. I mean, there's just so many things going on, so many layers. The costumes by Ariane Phillips, phenomenal. Um, and the casting by Victoria Thomas, brilliant. Music supervisor, Mary Ramos. Imagine being a music supervisor on a Quentin Tarantino film. That's got to be the pinnacle. There could be no better job, maybe other than working on Zodiac for Fincher than to get all of this period music. But then I wonder if the commercials fall under the music supervisor's role too, because all of the radio chatter in the commercials is such an important part of the film. And in fact, on the soundtrack, you get all of that in addition to the songs. Now, I don't know who's totally responsible for what I was talking about in terms of the sound effects, um, but the sound effects designers and editors are Harry Cohen, Sylvain Lassure, Leo Marcel, and Zach Goheen. If they're responsible for all those subtle wind effects and the howling effect under the Cielo Drive sign and all the other kind of brilliant audio things that really knit this film together, I think they really deserve uh, a lot of credit. And then there's one last brilliant mid credit surprise. Red Apple Cigarettes. Now, I smoke red apples, been smoking them for years, but since the Red Apple Tobacco Company's been around since 1862, you'll see this is a totally Hill straight period 50s edited and day, shot red cigarette apple commercial starring Rick Dalton. He had to roll his own, but today Red Apple comes factory rolled for the best drag with the best tobacco flavor with less burn on your throat than any other non filter cigarette. <laughs> Hmm. Well, that's the way a cigarette should taste. Hmm. Better drag. So here we have flavor. Rick Dalton on top of the world, clearly brown. at the height of his fame. And he's doing a great job, that's right? the red apple way. So look for this life-size standee of me, Jake Cahill, wherever fine red apple tobacco products are sold. Take a bite and feel all right. Take a bite of a red apple. Tell him Jake sent you. And cut. All right, this cigarette piece of fucking shit. And by the way, who chose this photo, all right? I have a double chin, all right? Nobody notices that crap. <laughs> it's almost as if Tarantino can't help but show us how this guy couldn't help himself while at the top. Is that the cautionary tale for him? To... And Robin. With exclusive news for KHJ listeners. It's the Bat Boon just... Secret Number Contest presented by Boss so Radio. Good. There's a terrific prize for the first KHJ listener to guess the secret number of our Bat Phone. Now, you know, all this stuff comes from Tarantino's actual childhood. I think I mentioned this in the original episode I did about the movie, that one of his big memories is driving around with his father in his father's car. Uh, a lot of the shots in the film, the car shots, are sort of shot from his POV as a child up through the window, looking out at the neon lights as they pass by. And it's such a great film. I love it. I really, really love this film. I loved watching it again 
for two hours and 40 minutes. It goes by so fast, I think, because of these incredible sequences and how meticulously put together they are. So this has been my episode about all of Leonardo DiCaprio's scenes as Rick Dalton in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I'm going to come back and do all of Brad Pitt's scenes as Cliff Booth. Coming up soon on the Full Cast and Crew Podcast. Thank you as ever for joining me. 